So culture wars. Well, the last decade has seen identity politics transform the Western world and movements such as Me Too and Black Lives Matter, Gay Pride and the transgender movement have told the captivating narrative of oppressed identity groups who are rising up to fight their societal oppressors. However, within this grand narrative, Christians have found themselves labeled as among the oppressors that need to be overthrown. And so in this webinar, we'll be looking at how we can speak for Christ in this challenging world of identity politics in, in ways that are faithful to the Bible, loving to our neighbors, and also credible to a hostile world. And uh, to address this really challenging subject, you're certainly game, Dr. Benjamin Chang. We have Dr. Chang with us today. And uh, Benjamin is a speaker, writer. He's an emergency physician doctor in London, and he speaks regularly at conferences, churches, and universities on a whole range of issues, including bioethics, COVID, and identity politics. And, and uh, Benjamin, you've got a new book coming out just next year on Christ and the culture wars, speaking for Jesus in a world of identity politics, which is going to be published by Christian Focus, and it's coming out in spring 2023, which is in time for our ICMDA World Congress as well in June that year. So uh, we really look forward to that. And we very much look forward to what you've got to say to us today, uh, Benjamin, uh, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, great. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure and a privilege to be with you. Uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin Chang. Um, and as has uh, been mentioned by Peter already, uh, what we're going to be discussing uh, in this uh, next hour is uh, some of the core ideas in my uh, upcoming book uh, that is uh, being uh, published by Christian Focus, provisionally titled Christ and the Culture Wars. Um, so it's a particular privilege uh, to share some ideas that are particularly close uh, to my heart. Now, from the very top, uh, I want to acknowledge that the topics we will be tackling uh, in this talk are all highly sensitive, controversial, uh, and sometimes explosive. And undoubtedly for some watching, these topics will be personal, and in some cases painful. Uh, throughout this uh, webinar, uh, my, uh, I'm going to try to be as, as sensitive, as balanced, as kind, as careful, and as objective as I can be. My intention is obviously uh, not to cause offense or hurt, or even controversy, really. Uh, however, if I do inadvertently cause any of those things, uh, I want to begin by asking for grace and, if necessary, for forgiveness from all those who are watching. I hope that's all okay. So uh, here is where we are going. Um, we're uh, we're going to begin uh, by looking at the story of identity politics. We'll then be looking at three kind of classic Christian responses to our identity politics culture and then we're going to be ending by asking is there a better story a better way through so let's begin with the identity politics story now in the western world our culture is being radically transformed by what is often referred to as identity politics and so let's begin by asking what is identity politics? Here is my working definition. Identity politics is the phenomenon by which people have begun to move away from the traditional political divisions of left wing versus right wing or conservative versus liberal and have begun instead to coalesce around identity groups such as race, sexuality, gender and age. And these identity groups have built the foundations of movements that have changed the world. What follows now is a few slides just introducing uh, some of the biggest of these movements. So let's first begin with a brief word on feminism. Now, what is often called first wave feminism uh, began around the mid 19th century with activists, including the suffragettes, fighting, sometimes to martyrdom, for equal legal rights of men, particularly in the area 
of suffrage, the right to vote. Then, around the end of the uh, Second World War, uh, what is usually called second wave feminism shifted the focus of the campaigns to issues including equal pay for equal work and reproductive rights, particularly the rights to access contraception and abortion. However, within the last decade, I would suggest that feminism has seen quite a rapid evolution. And today's mainstream feminist movement speaks less about legal reform and parliamentary votes and more about, quote, smashing the patriarchy, deconstructing the structures and biases in society at large that privilege men and oppress women. The modern feminist movement gained significant momentum in 2017 as the grim revelations of sexual abuse cases in Hollywood, TV and business sparked the worldwide hashtag Me Too movement. So that's a very brief word on feminism. Turning now to race and Black Lives Matter. Now, the fight for racial equality and civil rights has a long and complex history around the world. The civil rights movements of the 18th and early 19th centuries on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean focused largely on the abolition of slavery. Then in the 20th century, uh, after the end of the American Civil War, the focus of activists was uh, largely on ending segregation and so-called Jim Crow laws. This was the era of the likes of Rosa Parks, John Lewis, and Martin Luther King Jr. However, in recent years, the narrative of the racial justice campaigners has been less around racial segregation and more about combating institutionalized racism, unconscious bias, and the ideology of white supremacy. Black Black Lives Matter summarize uh, their mission on their website as this. They exist to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the states and vigilantes. Moving on now to gay rights and gay pride. This is particularly timely uh, given it was International Gay Pride Month last month. Now, gay rights activism also has a long history and has seen some major legal and societal changes in the last few years. The gay pride marches go all the way back to the Stonewall riots of 1969. And in the UK, where I am at the moment, uh, in the last 25 years, gay people have won the right to serve in the military in 2000, adopt children in 2005, and to marry in 2014. However, again, the narratives of the gay rights lobby have shifted recently, I would suggest. Away from campaigning for parliamentary legislation and more towards finding and fighting personal homophobic deeds, words and thoughts. And the deconstruction of so-called heteronormativity, that is the view that Heterosexual relationships are the normative standard, and gay relationships are atypical or abnormal. The leading a gay rights organization uh, here in the UK and, and the biggest one in Europe is Stonewall. And here is Stonewall's mission statement, according to his website. Stonewall, uh, at Stonewall, we stand for gay, a lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, questioning, and ace LGBTQ plus people everywhere. We imagine a world where all LGBTQ plus people are free to be ourselves and can live our lives to the full. And finally, we turn to the trans rights movement. Now, transgender activism is certainly one of the youngest of the social justice movements. Up until 2013, gender dysphoria uh, was classed as a uh, psychiatric disorder by the American Psychiatric Association. And in under a decade, the prevailing view of transgenderism, at least here in the UK, has gone from psychiatric idiosyncrasy, 
to a celebrated part of our diverse society. But even in a couple of years, the trans narrative has moved from fighting against abuse and for the right to reassignment therapies to campaigning for the total deconstruction of binary gender. Even though this now put, puts them at odds with many gay rights and feminist activists. Today, there are gender neutral toilets all over my city of London. The Brit Music Awards, which are uh, kind of British equivalent of the Grammys, uh, have gone gender neutral, doing away with the male and female categories. And there's now a huge debate around the place of transgender women in women's elite sport. Now that is a very fast and overly simplistic summary of these movements, and I do apologize for that. And comments on the strengths and possible criticisms of these movements are beyond the remit of this talk. Uh, perhaps disappointingly to some, I am not going to be doing a critical analysis of these movements. But what I do want to point out here is that there is a common grand narrative that unites all of these movements. There is a common story they all share. And that is the story of the oppressed. Waking up to their oppression and thus becoming woke, and rising to fight against and overthrow their societal oppressors. Identity politics is the story of the oppressed rising up to fight against their societal oppressors. Which then begs the question, who are the oppressors? Well, it doesn't take much time to deduce some classic characteristics of the oppressors in this grand narrative. The oppressors in this story of identity politics are stereotypically white, male, straight, heterosexual, cisgendered as opposed to transgendered, politically conservative, and Christian. In this grand story of identity politics, Christians have found themselves labelled as the oppressors, the homophobic, transphobic, sexist, racist, anti-liberal, anti-progressive bigots who need to be overthrown. I wonder what you make of that. Now, it is worth at this point acknowledging that these accusations of oppression are not unfounded. Christians have been responsible for some horrendous acts of discrimination in history, from involvement in the transatlantic slave trade to reprehensible intolerance towards individuals based on their gender or sexuality. And the church abuse revelations that have come to the surface in the last couple of years and rocked the evangelical church show us beyond doubt that today's church has been home to the most abhorrent of oppression and abuse of power. I think there is major repentance that needs to be done in the church. I think it is only after we have repented and sought forgiveness that we can speak with any integrity about Jesus to our culture. But once we have repented, and sought forgiveness. How should Christians respond to this world of identity politics? Well, unsurprisingly, many Christians have not taken kindly to being labeled as the oppressors in the grand narrative of identity politics. And responses have varied across countries, theologies, and personalities. However, I think we can broadly summarize the main Christian responses into three broad groups. Mirror, argue, and ignore. And as will become uh, quite apparent, I think all three are problematic. So firstly, mirror. Mirror. 
one huge consequence of the rise of the social justice campaigns has been a reactive and mirroring response from groups labeled as the oppressors. Many white, middle-class, conservative Christians have responded to identity politics by hunkering down into their own identity groups. So, Black Lives Matter protests have been met with calls of White Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. The accusations of bigotry and phobia have been met with counter-accusations of snowflake and liberal elite. And the rise of liberal progressive movements has led to a rise in the popularity of far right groups, including neo-Nazis. And so we end up with the culture wars. I think, and some may disagree with this, but I think uh, this goes a reasonable way to explaining the election of Donald Trump in the US and the rise of far right parties across Europe, uh, such as the Front National in, in France. However, I think there are some deep and concerning issues with this mirroring response to identity politics. For one thing, this polarization of political discourse has turned productive political debate into abusive mudslinging. And sometimes the resulting escalation in political rhetoric spills over into full-blown violence on our streets. I do not think mirroring is a productive way to engage with these important issues. And I don't think it's particularly Christ-like either. Which brings us on to our second response, argue. Many who have been labeled as the oppressor groups have sought to argue against the identity politics narratives. And there are legitimate debates to be had. Is there any evidence that unconscious bias training actually works? Are puberty blockers safe to be giving to children? Is positive discrimination really fair? Can the gender pay gap be explained by factors other than employer prejudices? Now, people will come, uh, well, will have very uh, different answers uh, to these questions, but surely we can agree that they are reasonable questions that are worth discussing. However, the problem is that if you argue against any of the identity politics narratives, you very quickly run slap bang into cancel culture. One of the most frustrating things about identity politics is that if you publicly express any view that falls outside the range of, quote, politically correct opinions, you run the high risk of being cancelled deplatformed, blocked on Twitter, called a bigot and ignored. There is no room for debate. There are many examples of this. Let me just give you three very brief ones. In uh, 2020, before COVID wrecked all of our plans, uh, the evangelist Franklin Graham, who is Billy Graham's son, uh, was booked to do a large preaching tour of the UK. However, activists managed to pressure all of his booked venues to cancel his events due to his views on homosexuality and his support for Donald Trump. Although it is worth mentioning that after a series of legal battles, uh, Graham has successfully managed to begin his tour of the UK this year. Well, this man in the middle uh, is Professor Kenneth Zucker, who was psychologist in chief at the Toronto Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. In 2015, Zucker was abruptly fired and his gender identity clinic was shut down following a petition to, quote, limit Dr. Kenneth Zucker. The reason for the petition was that he used psychotherapy to help children feel more comfortable with their biological sex. An external review into his practices described his work as, quote, outdated and, quote, overly conservative. And then on the right of the screen, we have Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling, uh, whose views on transgenderism uh, have attracted vast amounts of abuse on social media and has led to employees at her publishers trying to boycott her new children's book. Now, I could list many more examples, uh, but the point here is that there appears to be little room for debate and argument 
in this culture of identity politics. Even suggesting a politically incorrect view can cause you to lose your place in public discourse. Now, this is something I believe we need to push back on. I think Christians should be defending the place of debate and disagreement in the public square. However, my fear is that if Christians continually reach for arguments as our primary means of engaging with identity politics, we may find ourselves increasingly cancelled from public discourse. Which brings us on to our third response, ignore. This is where I think most Christians fall. Many Christians are simply too scared to broach the topics of race or feminism or gender in public or indeed in private. And so we simply bury our heads in the sand. When we encounter these topics in conversations at the water cooler or school gate or pub, we just keep our heads down and wait for the danger to pass. And from the pulpit, our preachers just carry on doing the same talks and sermons and carol services that they have been doing for the past half century. However, I do not think this approach is working anymore. This is the evangelist, uh, Reverend Miko Tice, who uh, founded the Christianity Explored courses. In his excellent little book, uh, Honest Evangelism, uh, Rico Tice writes this. When the American evangelist Billy Graham came to the UK for the first time in 1954, he packed out stadiums night after night. He preached the cross and thousands put their faith in Christ. By the time I joined the staff at All Souls Langham Place in Church uh, in central London in 1994, the culture was hardening against Christianity. Today, and he's writing in 2015, people are, are on a totally different road. Our culture is defined by tolerance and permissiveness. Culturally, we're such a long way from biblical Christianity that people don't object to faith having engaged with it. They just simply dismiss it. Identity politics has caused a seismic shift in how society views and responds to Christianity. And yet many of our evangelistic talks still resemble the Billy Graham sermons of the 50s. And compare the UK's response to Billy Graham in the 50s to Franklin Graham in 2020. Identity politics is causing a global revolution that we simply can't ignore. And so, if mirroring, arguing, and ignoring have proven ineffectual at best, and frankly destructive at worst, what should we do? Is there another way to speak for Christ in the culture wars? I think there is. Here's a face uh, that many, uh, that some of you anyway, uh, may recognize from previous ICMD webinars. Uh, this is my friend and professor of psychiatry, Glenn Harrison. In his popular book, A Better Story, Glenn Harrison argues that the sexual revolution of the 70s and 80s was propelled by captivating and, and powerful stories and grand narratives of people finding sexual liberty and freedom and joy through no strings attached sex. He then goes on to argue that a Christian response to the uh, sexual revolution should not be composed of facts and rules and condemnations but rather with a more powerful counter-narrative, a better story. Here is what Glenn Harrison writes. Stories have the ability to grab people's attention, connect with their emotions, and open them up to the possibility of change. The change makers of the sexual revolution understood this. They condensed complex uh, intellectual arguments into memorable bite-sized messages and then wove them together into great stories. We cannot engage with a great narrative by deploying more facts. We have to tell a different story, a better story. We must out-narrate those with whom we disagree. I think Glenn Harrison is on the money here. 
And I think his principles very much apply to identity politics. To speak for Christ in the culture wars, I would suggest we need to tell a better story. And the more that I have reflected on identity politics, the more I have um, concluded that the ideas propelling the grand narrative of identity politics are actually deeply biblical ideas. Here are some of the ideas that drive the identity politics story. Freedom, liberation, justice, identity, diversity, equality, unity, peace. The Bible is soaked in these words, is it not? Christians do have a better story to tell. Let me give you a few possible examples. Let's take the issue of equality, the principle that everyone should be considered as having equal worth, regardless of their skin color or sexuality or gender or any other attributes. But does identity politics really give the best and most fulfilling answer to inequality? After all, if there is no God, and we are simply byproducts of an evolutionary process that favors the strong and the powerful over the weak and the vulnerable, then we have no reason to believe we are all equal. We can't get equality from biology. Perhaps a better story of equality would speak of a God who created all human beings in his image and thus endowed us all with intrinsic, immense and equal value. We are valuable not because of what we can do or how competitive we are or how we self-identify, but because of our image bearing of God. Well, let's take the evil of oppression. Identity politics tells the story of the oppressed minority groups waking up to their oppression and then rising to fight their societal oppressors. However, does identity politics really give the best and most satisfying answer to the evil of oppression? After all, can we really bisect society into oppressed versus oppressor, good versus bad? If we honestly reflect on our own hearts, do we not all encounter a complex mixture of good and bad within all of us? Perhaps a better, more complete diagnosis of human nature would tell of a disease, the disease of sin, that contaminates the human heart and makes us uh, want to be gods of our own lives, even if it harms those below us. And rather than dichotomizing society into good and bad, perhaps what we need is a universal, comprehensive and eternal solution to the problem of sin. Or we could perhaps look at the principle of liberty. A lot of the social justice campaigns are driven by the idea that the repressed and enslaved should be set free to live their autonomous lives in whatever way they want. However, does identity politics really give the best and most complete story of liberty and freedom? After all, does freedom really mean the ability to live however we please? I mean, if we lived in a society where everyone acted that way, surely it would be anarchy, not paradise. Perhaps a better story of liberty would begin with a world enslaved by sin and death and tell of a saviour who died so that we might be set free. But this freedom does not come from total autonomy but rather by living the way we were meant to live. God's commands are not repressive diktats we follow begrudgingly. No, they are a solid moral framework that show us how we can flourish in God's creation. Surely that is true liberty. Or we could take the idea of identity. We all want our identity. Uh, we want to find our identity, sorry. Uh, to remain true to it, and for this identity to be recognized by others. Remember the motto of Stonewall? Stonewall imagines a world where gay people can 
do what they want to do? No, to be themselves. It's all about identity. But does identity politics really give the best and most complete answer to people's need for identity? After all, is my core identity really reducible to my race or sexuality or gender? Is that it? This is where Christianity can provide a much richer and better story on identity. The Bible speaks of our identity as image bearers of God who have been adopted into God's family and who are co-heirs with Christ, destined to rule the universe with him. That is an identity far bigger, more secure, and more satisfying than anything we could forge or find. And finally, we can look at the principle of justice. Wrongs need to be righted, and those who have oppressed and abused others need to be held accountable for their actions. But does identity politics really give the best and most fulfilling answer to the great injustices of this world? After all, in an atheistic worldview, there is no objective moral law to hold people accountable to. There is no rule book in the sky. Morality and justice are nothing more than evolved instincts and social conventions. And so on what authority can we impose justice on others? This is where Christians can provide a more solid foundation for our conviction that justice needs to be served. The Bible speaks of a God who cares about the wrongs committed on his earth. And he will one day bring total and perfect justice on those who have harmed others and the world. And he mandates his followers to fight for the oppressed and champion justice for the sinned against. Brothers and sisters, Christians do have a better story to tell. As we uh, come into land, um, I'd like to end uh, on this book, The 3D Gospel by Jason Georges. It's a, it's a little book um, and it's, it's well worth reading. In uh, The 3D Gospel, Georges argues that there are, in very general terms, three broad cultures in the world. Guilt, innocence cultures, predominantly in the global West, where you don't do bad things because it's against the rules and you'll be punished. On a shame cultures, predominantly in the global East, where you don't do bad things because it will bring shame and dishonor on you and your family. And power fear cultures, predominantly in the global South, where people are more aware of omens and spirituality. And you don't do bad things because you don't want to anger the spiritual realm. Georges then uh, argues that the gospel has powerfully impacted all three cultures. But the gospel presentation that resonates most differs between the cultures. In guilt, innocence cultures, the gospel message that has resonated most has been the message that we have all broken God's laws and deserve punishment. But Jesus died on the cross and in doing so, bore our punishment and paid our penalty so that we might be declared innocent before God the judge. In honor shame cultures, the gospel message that has resonated most has been the message that we have abandoned our heavenly father and dishonored his name. But Jesus came from the place of highest honor to bear our shame on the cross so that we might be reconciled with our father and rejoin the royal family. And in power fear cultures, the gospel message that has resonated most has been the message that the world is ruled by the devil who has blinded our eyes. But Jesus died on the cross and in doing so disarmed and defeated Satan's sin and death. So that if we join with him, we might share in his victory. So that's uh, my summary of George's book. And there are a few caveats I'd like to mention. 
Firstly, as George acknowledges, this summation of world cultures is overly simplistic. There are clearly more than three cultures in the world, and all cultures exhibit elements of all three groups. And secondly, I do not think George's is suggesting that we should slice up the gospel and apportion different parts to different people. I do believe in the words of the Lausanne Convention that we need to take the, quote, whole gospel to the whole world. We should teach the victory of the cross in the West and penal substitution in the East, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course we should. But all that being said, I still think George's is making a profound and important point. And that is that the gospel resonates with a culture when it speaks the language of the culture. The gospel resonates with a culture when it speaks the language of the culture. I'd like to end by proposing that maybe just maybe, we are seeing the emergence of a fourth culture. Perhaps we could call it an oppression liberation culture. And maybe we will see the gospel resonate with our culture when we start speaking the language of the culture, the language of freedom, liberation, Justice, identity, diversity, equality, unity, peace. Maybe, just maybe, that is how we should speak for Christ in the culture wars. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks very much, Benjamin, for an incredibly comprehensive uh, overview of a really challenging topic but also for making it so clear and breaking it down in, in such a, a great way uh, you, you've really challenged us and educated us at the same time and if you've if you've just joined us we've been listening to dr benjamin chang talking on the subject of speaking for christ in the culture wars uh, just a reminder we've got a q a time now so uh, benjamin perhaps we can just start off with a question you you yourself, uh, you do a lot of speaking in churches, university groups, and so on. And and I'm and assume that a lot of these groups will, will will not be Christians. They're coming from perhaps more hostile audiences. And in in framing this uh, fourth cultural context, if you like, of oppression and liberation, and and the the bridges of equality, oppression, liberty, identity, justice, and so on as, as, as tools to engage. Uh, how, how have you found uh, this approach practically? Uh, and and mm. uh, what sort of change has it, uh, what sort of journey have you been on perhaps yourself as an evangelist and apologist in um, trying to speak the language of contemporary Western culture in a way that, mm. that engages with people from you know, perhaps a more woke perspective, if you like. Mm, yeah. Um, when I was at university, um, the biggest uh, questions that uh, were tackled in um, kind of Christian Union uh, evangelistic events and church events were usually around things like science and uh, suffering and the credibility of the Bible. Um, and those topics... Um, I think rightly warranted a, a response in the form of here is why our opponents are wrong <laughs> and here is why we are right. <laughs> and, it, and it was that kind of um, debate uh, and approach that certainly I um, have deployed in the past and, uh, and many others and many apologists do as well uh, to try and identify the errors and the, um, the problems with your opponent's view, the atheist worldview yeah. or whatever, and then showing how we are correct and they are wrong. However, I have been on um, a bit of a, a journey away from that now um, in response to uh, what is a new culture where I don't think the primary objections to Christian faith are, uh, we think you're wrong or illogical or anti-science, um, but rather that we think you're bigoted and phobic and oppressive. 
And taking the approach of what I've called the old apologetics and trying to apply that today simply just reinforces the idea that we're the oppressors. We're going to tell you you're wrong. And I think um, a better response, uh, at least um, from my experience, has been one where we go, yeah, we agree. We agree that uh, men and women should be equal, uh, that, that people who are oppressed should be set free, that justice needs to be asserted, et cetera, et cetera. We agree with that. But does our culture give us the most complete, best story? Might there be another story, perhaps a more complete one out there? And I certainly find that if that I, when I've done, uh, adopted that approach, um, it uh, triggers kind of less hostility, less um, anger uh, than I think if I were to go down the line of saying, this is why you're wrong and this is why I'm right. Um, so yeah, I think that's basically the um, uh, the kind of journey that I've been on, uh, and I'm certainly uh, I certainly do not uh, hold myself up as the <laughs> exemplar that everyone should follow. This is just kind of my my thoughts and my ideas um, of where perhaps um, perhaps one way we can uh, tackle these topics. It's interesting when we look at the apostles and uh, the way they did evangelism. They always packaged their message in a different way, depending on who the audience were, who, who was listening, you know. So you mm. see Paul talking to the farmers at Lystra is very different from Jews in the synagogue or the philosophers at Athens and so on. Yeah. And uh, this whole approach of, of taking uh, common ground or or looking for bridges, and, and that's the, what you've, uh, uh, in effect, been doing uh, here. Yeah. I think you know, Paul says I've become all things to all men so that uh, I, I might save some. I think that I think this is what he's referring to. The gospel doesn't change, but the gospel presentation differs depending on his context. Yes, and, and yet he did uh, meet real opposition, didn't he? And it was mm. uh, angry opposition. So we, we must think, therefore, that if we get it right, everyone's going to like what we're going to say. There's, there's still going to be uh, a reaction against the message of, of the gospel. It will inevitably always divide people, um, will it not? Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, uh, and, and that's something that we need to be aware of. And I think also it's helpful to think of it in context. The opposition that we face is frankly, at least here in, in, in the UK where I am, um, the opposition that I face is nothing compared with uh, my brothers and sisters all across the world and indeed the church throughout history. Um, and, and so I think we need to be aware that yes, we, we are facing opposition uh, and perhaps increasingly so, uh, but in historical context, this is not new and this is not, this is certainly not the worst it's been. Do you, do you think, um... I mean, people listening to this are going to come from a whole variety of different cultural contexts and, and representing all of the, the global West, global East, global South views and, and the new view that you've described as well. And so th this will resonate more with some people uh, than with, with others, I guess. But uh, how do you see things working out in the future with these cultural changes in the West? Are, are we starting to see a turning uh, against it, um, or, or or do you think it's really inevitable that this is going to saturate the whole culture? I, I was interested, for example, to see in the recent uh, leadership election for the, the Tory party in the UK, how one candidate who'd been classed as perhaps a little more woke, what, uh, it actually turned out to her disadvantage in, in the mm. end. Do you, do you think there's a turning in general society against this whole new mm. narrative. I certainly think there is a temptation to see uh, events like uh, this, um, the, the, the one that you mentioned as a possible turning um, of the societal tide. Um, and certainly when you, you can ask the question, you know, if this is our prevailing culture, how do you explain Donald Trump? How do you explain uh, the rise of, of right-wing conservatism? Um, maybe I'm perhaps more of a pessimist in this. Um, I think that's more of a symptom of the polarization of culture uh, rather than a kind of swinging of the tide. I think as it's, it's basically the result of, what, of the mirroring response uh, where as these liberal movements gain uh, popularity, there is a kind of reactive um, 
a response from those labeled as the oppressors that then divides political opinion more and more. And we're seeing that, especially in America, but I think around the world, um, of people just becoming increasingly um, polarized and, and increasingly entrenched in their views. And so, yes, we're going to see people who um, kind of really push hard against um, this uh, this identity politics narrative, who are not Christian. You know, there are lots of other groups who also are very skeptical of it. Um, but I don't think we should see that necessarily as as the tide is turning. I, I think I think it is just polarization. Uh, maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but I think that's my initial thoughts. It, it's I think it's striking that it seems to be a little bit more opposition to it than there was initially. And I mean, when, when the transgender revolution first happened, no one really knew what to say. Um, whereas mm. now it's a lot more. Uh, Trevor Stammers, who you'll know, is uh, saying thanks so much for your talk. Benjamin, why do you think that so many mature Christians who know the quote unquote better story are embracing what Trevor's calling wokery, particularly of the <laughs> sexual kind? I guess it's about the, 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 the view and the culture influencing that of the church. But what, why do you think that is, that we're fighting these battles within the church? Mm. I think the first thing to acknowledge, and it's something that I want to readily acknowledge publicly, and that is this, the narrative of identity politics is really powerful. Um, and the storytellers of the revolution, as Glenn Harrison puts it, did a really, really good job of capturing hearts and minds. Uh, they told these stories of these you know, vulnerable, um, lonely, you know, gay young people who then found kind of themselves and found freedom through the sexual revolution. And, and, and you can tell you can replicate these stories across all of the different movements. And so the stories are powerful. Um, and, and therefore, I don't think we should necessarily be that surprised that it has begun to infiltrate uh, the church um, and, uh, in some cases, the, the leadership of, of uh, church denominations. And essentially, I think that the, the evangelical ch uh, church and, and Christians who want to hold firm to the Bible have been very late to the game, I think, uh, are still trying to do the Billy Graham thing of just preach, uh, repent and believe, and, and, and you know, people will, will flock in their thousands to, to do so, um, or to kind of debate the issues and argue with them. And that's the way that we convince people. Um, and I think that that has essentially, we've tried this and it, it's not really worked very well. Um, and when you're um, encountering a really powerful story, what you can't do is argue against it. You can't argue against the story you have to actually outstory a story. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a mixture of the power of the of the revolution and our kind of perhaps delayed response uh, to to the to the issues at hand. You've touched a little bit, Benjamin, on on, on the question of deconstructing, uh, particularly with regard to the, the whole trans narrative or you know deconstructing the man woman binary uh, heteronormativity and so on. David Child's asking here. Um, uh, building on that, with, with the deconstructionism that forms part of identity politics and critical theory, do the culture wars, do you think, have a broader long-term agenda of paving the way for, for Marxism and the central overarching mm -hmm. role of the state? You know, uh, often people will talk about that this is a new expression of cultural Marxism and that the whole yeah. idea of oppressor and oppressed comes out mm -hmm. of the, the Marxist narrative yeah um i would agree that um what we're seeing in our culture is um i think as a result of some of the ideas of uh, marxism um so for perhaps for those who are watching um marxism describes society as this struggle between uh, the bourgeoisie the upper class and the proletariat the working class and and uh, Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto was a call to revolution for the bourgeoisie to rise up against the proletariat. Um, and identity politics basically widens that narrative. So it's not just about class, but it's also about race and sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the broader agenda for all these movements, I, I don't think there is a kind of big ultimate agenda in the minds of all activists. Um, I think it is a more um, uh, kind of spread out um, set of movements that don't really um I, I don't think they have a kind of a defined unifying final end goal um and that is 
a question that I've often posed uh, to people. You know, what is the end goal of all this? What is, you know, okay, if we end up with, um, you know, a, a, a representation of this particular identity group in this particular situation, then what? What happens then? And, and it is a quite a difficult thing for uh, a lot of people to answer. What is the end goal of all this? Um, rather, I think it's more of a reaction to the problems, legitimate problems around oppression and, and, and abuse and, and discrimination. Um, so yeah, I don't think there is necessarily a, a unified end goal. And just um, on the topic of um, uh, deconstruction of binary gender, I think this is quite a good example of this. So Stonewall has publicly um, said that they're inclusive of the trans movement and they support the trans um, uh, lobby. But there's a group um, within a Stonewall that said, whoa, whoa, hang on a minute. If um, male and female doesn't matter, then what does being gay mean? If, if I'm gay, then it matters the the sex, the gender of my partner. And so there's been a group that's come out of Stonewall to form the LGB Alliance. And now the, uh, the Stonewall are calling the LGB Alliance transphobic and the LGB Alliance is causing, uh, calling Stonewall homophobic. Stonewall is homophobic. Um, I think that's quite a good example of how actually there isn't a united end goal of all this. It's, it's, it's more disparate than that. Yeah, so... Uh... Perhaps there's not a, a human uh, force working uh, with an agenda, but Lauren Bickle is asking here, can you briefly address Satan's influence uh, in spiritual warfare in all this? I mean, after all, he lies, steals, kills, destroys, and, and so on. Is, is there a, a kind of bigger cosmic conspiracy behind mm. it, creating and seeding mm. confusion to blind people's eyes to the gospel? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm always slightly hesitant um, to attribute certain events or uh, issues um, to the devil. I think simply because I I, um, I prefer C.S. Lewis's approach in Screw Tape Letters, whereby, yes, Satan, if he can um, get you through full frontal attack, he will. But actually, um, Satan works in the in the subtle and in the everyday in order to kind of subtly pull um christians away um and i think that is is happening just across the board in, in every area of life that being said i think the the idea of deception and the um, decay of truth in our society which um we've not mentioned but it's i think an important element to the identity politics narrative i think that is really dark um, so in Revelation, you have uh, the dragon who's the Satan, and he has these two beasts. And the first beast attacks the church through persecution. But the second beast attacks the church through deception. So it mimics Jesus in its appearance and its actions. And it gives life to the image of the first beast. It makes what is fake become real. Um, and, and this is, um, I think, one of Satan's biggest uh, weapons against the church is deception, is lies, is um, the de decay of truth. So this idea, this postmodern notion that truth is relative, that if something's true for you, it's not true for me, I actually see this as quite dark, as quite evil, this degradation of truth. Um, so yeah, that's probably that's kind of one way I think perhaps I can see um, the, the, you know, the devil at work in, in, in our culture. Goodness, uh, we're almost running out of time, Benjamin, and there's a huge number of questions, uh, <laughs> which I think is, you know, a credit to the fact that you've really stimulated people. Can I, a, a question here from Elliot Larson. So Elliot's asking, in your mention of Donald Trump, you, you seem to deprecate political action in confronting identity politics. Do you, do you see any role for political action on the part of of Christians, or, or should we just be trying to tell our story in a way that connects better in the new paradigm? Mm, oh, I absolutely believe there's a place for political action uh, for Christians. Uh, and I apologize if I gave uh, the impression of, uh, otherwise. Um, I think we as Christians are called um, to uh, love and serve and uh, our communities and be salt and light in our worlds um, both the world at large but our individual worlds and medicine and our countries and our cultures um and that's not just evangelism but also uh, making the world better 
Um, and I think uh, we have a duty, um, uh, those of us who are perhaps called to um, political engagement in whatever way, to use the tools of politics to, um, uh, to, to serve Jesus and to love our neighbor and to be salt and light in our world. So I definitely think there is a place for political involvement for Christians and political lobbying. Um, I, I do think that's the case. Uh, and there are certainly uh, specific issues in which I think this is really, really important, and uh, particularly medical issues. Um, and so, yeah, my, my presentation was less around uh, how we deal with specific issues that have come out from this culture, but more about uh, evangelism and, and, and talking about Jesus within, within our culture. Uh, but that's perhaps a, another topic for another day. Yes, and I guess touching on that, it's a whole question of freedom of speech, isn't it? And that the cancel culture uh, provides a threat to that. And of course, if there's not freedom of speech, then there's not the freedom to evangelize and debate and, and, and have these mm. discussions. Do, well, one tricky question to, to finish, Avengers, you've done incredibly well, but um, from uh, Sunita Badari here is asking, um, is it a bad thing to want to smash the patriarchy? Uh, after all, patriarchy <laughs> has caused a lot of oppression of women in history and current society as well. What do you think of Christian feminism? Can one be Christian and feminist? And, and it was interesting the way you sketched out the, the uh, three waves of feminism. And, and I think certainly in the first wave, uh, there'd be very few Christians who would disagree with any of, of what was being asked mm. for. But, but what's what your response? Can, can you be Christian and feminist? And if so... Mm. What, what what are the what are the boundaries? It's <laughs> a big question. Um, we do a whole session on this one. Um, uh, I, I mean, it would have to depend on how you are defining feminism um, and indeed patriarchy. Um, I, I, as you say, I think uh, first wave feminism, equal um, uh, right to vote, and, and certainly issues around equal pay. Um, I think Christians um, should not just agree with it, but support it wholeheartedly. And, and certainly the uh, countries around the world where um, there are different um, legal rights for men and women. Um, I certainly think that Christians should engage with this and, and fight for equality. But I think there are clearly areas that we need to identify which Christians um, uh, disagree with and and, and perhaps should um, not, in, uh, not um, support uh, in the modern feminist movement that we know. I mean, uh, we're at ICMDA, so perhaps the um, issues around abortion is, is, is an obvious thing. Um, and also the questions around um, how exactly do we respond to um, uh, the inequalities or perceived inequalities um, between men and women, and, and are the modern femi feminist solutions actually the best ones? And that takes a lot of work, trying to pick apart what we agree with and what we disagree with. But I suppose, and, and given this is the last... Um, question I, I do want to perhaps end on on Jesus um who came into the world in a highly highly patriarchal culture uh, where men were seen as much more valuable than women and we see Jesus um really smashing the patriarchy you know he he loved and and served and uplifted women and particularly women who were the most rejected by his society prostitutes a woman caught in adultery uh, a woman who'd had five uh, husbands mm. and then at the end of his earthly ministry he entrusts the greatest news in human history the resurrection first to women and so in that sense jesus was um smashing the patriarchy and and, and paved the way uh for the invention of human rights and all sorts of other um things um so yes um i think uh christians should be on the forefront fighting for equality uh, between men and women but also discerning enough to see where our um, story differs from the story of our culture. Dr. Benjamin Chang, thanks so much for your time today, for the work that you're doing, for, for giving us such a clear and comprehensive overview of this and, and leading us to some good approaches, uh, particularly in sharing the gospel and engaging with the culture in which we're increasingly finding ourselves. May the Lord bless you in your work and continue to give you courage and power and opportunity as well. May God bless you and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.